Hey everybody, so today we have a pretty different form of content for everybody. Uh, it's very long form and it was put together by our good friends over at White Lights Media. So I would definitely first off recommend going and checking them out on Instagram and YouTube because they put out some really great stuff. They do a fair bit of meat coverage, photo and video packages, those kinds of things. And Samuel, um, one of the co-owners I believe, <clears throat> was good enough to come along with us for large chunks of our UK trip. Um, so we have a whole bunch of footage from there, both training footage, um, seminar footage, and some interview stuff uh, that they put together into a really cool package. It is a bit longer, um, but uh, check it out and hopefully everybody enjoys. Also, just as a quick aside, make sure and go check out calvarybarbell.com slash apparel. Our new classic line has dropped, so go get you some. Enjoy the video, everybody. People look at us and say, these people want to put 500 pounds on their back? What, why? What makes them do that? There's still a lot of coffee on that. Yeah, sorry buddy. No, I don't lift. My suits and shirts are pretty strong though. One of the biggest things I kind of see that people screw up in the squat or, or where they screw up is they just don't take their time in the setup. Take your time, lots of time. Uh, make sure everything's set the way you want it because once you stand up with that weight, you can't put it back down. And uh, if you've messed up that portion of the moon, you're just setting yourself up to fail. When the weight gets heavy, do you get pitched forward a little bit? Yeah. You lose that upper back? Yeah. yeah. That's it's probably the biggest thing. And that look, that's light for you, right? Like your sleeves aren't even on yet. Um, so the biggest thing I think is just gonna be pulling, pinning those shoulder blades down harder. So right as you hit the bottom, there's this instant of like hit. Even, even with this light weight, those shoulder blades are just elevating just a tiny bit as you hit the bottom. So if you can really focus on just pinning those shoulder blades into your lats and, and really focusing on that, especially as you hit the bottom and as you initiate your, your concentric, your upward phase of the movement, that's gonna be big, big, big for you. Okay. Everything else looks good, your hinge looks good, your bottom position looks good, but as you hit the bottom, we're getting this hit, little bit where the shoulders are elevating. So really hammer those down. Let's see a couple more reps here. I think that's something that you can just like mentally cue a little bit and it'll make a big difference. There you go, nice and smooth into the bottom, don't rush it. Tight lap, there you go, good. Good, right as you hit the bottom, hammer those lats. Beautiful, good. Two more. Lots of lats. Good, that was better. Okay, don't let those shoulders shift. Good, nicely done.
bunch of sport drinking carbonates in it. Like, I don't know, maybe that's just a cultural thing, but that's insane to me. The last thing I want is bubbly inside while I'm working out. Mate, you got it. <laughs> Three whites. <laughs> Just to depth and no lower is what I usually recommend for people. Um, it's cool seeing people like dunk squats and things like that, but uh, you don't get any like bonus points in meets for squatting deeper. Um, also, there's like there's just a greater chance that you're going like things are going to go wrong. Stay there. You cool if I touch you back a little? Okay, so pull your shoulder blades in. Go up, right there. About that. Does that feel super weird? Good. All right, so now when you start your squat, I want you to keep your ribs down in the front so your abs are nice and tight. I want you to push your weight back on your heels so your butt comes out behind you just a little bit, and then try to sit straight down. There, now push up. Good. So back on your heels, butt out a little bit, straight up. Good. Awesome, okay, go ahead and rack it up. So that, that little change there might, it, it, it might make a difference in the long run, um, especially if, if you do it and like immediately it feels more stable, that's a good thing. Because a lot of times what happens when we get that, uh, that sort of knee cave, it can be a, a, a result of losing tightness and losing tension in the bottom. If you're trying to squat as low as possible and you're getting out of position, uh, it's causing, you know, some butt wake or things like that, or just loss of tightness, uh, I just don't see the point of trying to squat any lower if it's gonna get you out of position. Just the depth, no lower. Um, and if people are kind of dunking or squatting too deep, uh, I just say, like, learn to cut them a little bit higher. It's gonna feel weird at first, um, but then just go from there and just try to build that from there.
How does that feel? Not bad as I'm a fatigue Not bad. as fuck. <laughs> What's that? A fatigue as fuck. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fair. So one of the things that we're seeing is you have a really narrow hand position, right? Yeah. So as you hit the bottom, we're kind of getting this happening in the okay. upper back. So the, yeah. the elbows are rocking forward to try and make up for some, some lack of stability. I would play with a bit of a wider okay. position yeah. to see if you can better retain or better maintain tension in that upper back. Yes, yeah, it's on like hand. Exactly, right? And that's probably why low bar was giving you so much issue. Because yeah. if you were narrow in here and you went like this, yeah. like that's a lot of external rotation demand on that shoulder, right? Yeah. It could could be causing some some pain. And just really think about keeping those those elbows like pulled together. Yeah. Yeah. Try not more to let them slide. The bar, no, less under the bar. Yeah, less yeah. under the bar. More, more, and I don't want, I don't necessarily want you like this yeah. either, right? I just want them like here. Yeah. Think about pulling the elbows together. To the, to the lat. And think about just yeah. pulling the shoulder blade down yeah. into the lat. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a little bit wider than usual. Yeah, normally I have it on the knurling. Yeah. Like Let's go even a little even a little wider. Even a little wider? Yeah, right there. Right there. Perfect. Yeah. Good. So all that tension here, there you go, and in here. That's it. That's it. Good. Set that stance up. There you go. Especially into the bottom, keep those shoulder blades tight. Nice, there you go. Good, one more. Shoulder blades tight. Yeah, good, all right. Yep, shoulder blades tight. Nice, there we go. When you get into the hole, okay, what I usually just like to rec recommend to people is try to feel the floor. If you can continue to feel pressure through your feet uh, in the right spot, like I was talking about, big toe, little toe, heel, whole foot, anything like that, um, you're probably going to keep your joints stacked where they want to be. Uh, if you feel pressure, shift forward to your, your toes, right, all the way it's going to be in your quads, you're not going to be loaded through the hips anymore. If you're sitting too far back on your heels, you're probably too much in your hips and not using your quads enough. Okay? So Try to feel the floor, feel the floor through your whole foot, and you're probably gonna keep everything kind of moving where it needs to be moving. Does anyone have any questions?
I want everybody to take two minutes and just close your eyes. Just close your eyes, and I want you to think about your best performance ever. Now, this can be in the gym, this can be at a meet, whatever that might be. Just think about your best performance ever. And Bryce Krawcheck from Calgary, do you believe it, looking to push the pole right off of the podium. Is it possible? Oh, this, this would, would be, be absolutely shocking if he could pull this off. Honestly, and, I think he might be good for it. And he might, and the crowd is behind him. 387.5 kilos loaded on the bar. Nobody would have thought we would see this happen. Everybody's on their feet for Bryce Krawcheck, and the ceiling is about to come down on us. Whoa! This is the most insane crowd I have ever seen. That's probably one of the craziest things I've experienced in my life. Like, I've probably, you probably heard me tell this story before, but like I have my headphones in at max volume, and when I took my headphones out to get out onto the platform, it was actually louder in the venue than my like cranked up death metal that I was listening to. So it was, it was insane, man. It was a real big bummer to like not break the bar off the floor right after that and then hear all of that screaming go to like, oh. It was a bit heartbreaking, but I don't know if I'll ever have the opportunity to like experience that again. So it was great, it was really cool. I don't even know if I like have the ability to appreciate it, you know, like. Not that I don't appreciate it, but I don't know. There's just something really cool about that that I feel like I have my I have a hard time wrapping my head around it even, you know? So take note, were you relaxed or were you really amped up? Were you calm or were you really anxious? Did you feel like you were in control or out of control? Energetic, or were you feeling very fatigued? And lastly, what was your self-talk like? What were the things that you were telling yourself during this time where you were performing incredibly well? All right, everybody can open their eyes.
Well, that's why we all started lifting weights, right? Yeah, when I was like 16, I wasn't like, oh, I want to deadlift the most. I was like, I want to be jacked. Because chicks dig jacked guys, and then you realize that like, no, guys that lift weights dig jacked guys. <laughs> So you are doing worlds, hey? Yeah. How you feeling? Yeah, pretty good, man. Getting a bit antsy? That's a good thing, I think, yeah. <laughs> if you were already like, oh, I don't know about this, like, <laughs> that's not where you want to be. But if you're feeling like, all right, let's, let's put some weight on the bar, that's usually a pretty good sign. I don't think at this point that I power lift to like, be the best or, or like beat everybody or have all the records or whatever. I just love the competition, man. I love getting in there and like, jockeying and making deadlift changes and like, you know, that kind of stuff just, oh, that's the best, that's the best stuff. But in terms of the competition itself, like, uh, other than, you know, like you gotta time your knee wraps and you gotta do all that kind of stuff, like the competition equipped is just, it's a whole other ball game, I think, and a different type of mental challenge. Um, I think even going back to raw competitions after competing equipped was like, Okay, well, I guess, I guess I'm ready to lift. Whereas equipped, you're huffing and puffing and yanking on your knee wraps and straps up and wraps and like making sure everything's set. It just seems a lot more intense. And the interesting thing is people like to fight about it and be like, oh, one's better than the other. But it's like raw lifting wouldn't be here if it wasn't for equipped lifting. And equipped lifting wouldn't be popular again if it wasn't for raw lifters that brought more people into the sport. You know what I mean? So I think there's a lot of people that got into the sport because of raw lifting's accessibility fell in love with powerlifting and now are looking for like a different challenge or something like that. So it's all like, it's all so uh, complimentary. Yeah, I put, I put it on the other day, um, yeah. after Euros. I benched 282 in it without a belt. Oh shit, I remember that. Um, it was in the video. Because it was what I used to wear, yeah. like four years ago. And obviously I'm bigger now, so it's so fucking tight. Perfect. What a prick, hey? Eh? I just threw my bench shirt on for the first time in four years and cranked out 282. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna do 300 across the board. Nice. <laughs> That'd be the play, man. That's the, that's the play. I'll be looking for that on the scoreboards now. Yeah. We'll see, man, I don't know. I feel like it's gonna be a hell of a lot of fun either way. Tony Cliff seems like he's a pretty damn good dude. He's made some pretty vicious comments about my bench press in the past. Yeah, yeah, it's not a bad bench for like a 59 kilo woman or some such thing. So that makes me think that he and I would get along. Um, why the hell would you wanna to listen to me about bench press, right? Um, so I'm, no, I'm not the world's best bench presser. Uh, I've, I've just recently benched 182 and a half kilos raw and uh, my best equipped bench is 245 kilos. So as a 105 kilo lifter, that's not crazy. crazy. Because of that sort of not being initially gifted at the bench press, I've really become, uh, out of necessity, sort of a student of the lift. I've spent a lot of time on my technique. I've spent a lot of time doing reps. Um, I'm doing five to six bench variations a week. So I spend a lot of time with the lift um, because that's what's needed for me to progress in it. I don't think
think that more arch equals a better bench press. But in a lot of cases, if there's something that we can improve in our arch, if we can get a little bit more, have it still be comfortable um, and you know sound from a biomechanics standpoint, then trimming the range of motion might be beneficial. Essentially what we do is we sort of internally rotate the grip um, and that for some people allows a little bit more comfortable pressing. Um, placing some of the emphasis on the pressing again, there's just this spot right here towards the outside of the bar. Now for me when I, when I made that switch, it helped me go from sort of over tucking the elbows to a bit better uh, sort of neutral elbow position. This is your time to shine, man. So what, what did you do to your, uh, to your leg, ankle? Ooh, that sounds really crappy. Yeah, absolutely. I won't say more leg drive. All right, keep that chest high. There you go, good. Nice tight upper back. Nice, good. We saw a little bit of chest fall, even between reps sometimes, especially with more reps in a set. I'll actually take a couple of reps and then be like, yes. like get tight. You kind of got to remind yourself every like two or three reps in some cases to, to not lose that or to not compromise that as the set wears on. Um, but other than that, like your bar path looks good, your tightness, especially for not being able to use any leg drive, looks it looks really good, man. Yeah, like I said, I think, you know, once you have that addition of leg drive, it's gonna be like, oh, there we go. I want you to press with your back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the first movement of the press should be a squeezing of the muscles between your upper back. Okay. So as you initiate the press, if you can hardwire yourself to like squeeze the back and press, like as the first movement of the press, okay, yeah. okay, then that yeah. can sometimes help you like keep that back just a little bit tighter. Because it's that crucial moment of like when you start the press, if things aren't tight back there, that's where we get that, uh, that like loss of position in the shoulders. Let's, let's try a couple reps like that. Good. All right. Chest up. Squeeze the back as you press. There you go. Squeeze the back as you press. Good. Squeeze the back as you press. Nice. I was gonna say, I don't know if you're just like that much more warmed up or what, but that weight looked infinitely more comfortable. Oh yeah, hugely. Yeah. Hugely, yeah, awesome. It's a combination of like a little bit of a flare and just bringing that bar back. So maybe we do see a little bit of elevation even in the scapula, like as that kind of happens. Um, but just keeping that in, in sort of a controlled manner so we don't get out here, right? So it's, it's, I think another thing that helped me a little bit was getting into a shirt and kind of understanding right. that as well as like the overload. Yeah. Uh, overload seems to be a pretty decent driver for me. Um, and that's the biggest thing is just learning to like analyze your training and look at, okay, when I'm doing these exercises, these rep ranges, this intensity, this amount of volume, am I, am I progressing? And if so, then how do we break it down and figure out which of those components is actually contributing? Yeah. Uh, and Taylor and I will talk about that in the, in the programming uh, and sort of coaching compare and contrast that we're gonna do. Yeah. But he and I program a little bit differently and I use a, a, like a bottom-up periodization. I'm not sure if you're familiar with like Mike T's emerging strategies and that kind of stuff. 
mic to Sheer? Yeah. yeah, he's a wizard genius. It seems like it's easy for him to think outside of the box. Like his brain just doesn't work like most people's. So he comes up with these like just incredible theories, super systematic ways for trying things out, and then like finds out what works and what doesn't. So like he's he's started what I think is a pretty noticeable like paradigm shift in programming philosophy and periodization. Um, a big change in the model from, from a top-down perspective of periodization to a bottom-up perspective of periodization. So his, his emerging strategies, he calls it, has kind of, in my opinion, has really like reshaped how a lot of coaches think about coaching, which like is a pretty astounding feat. You know what I mean? He reinvented the wheel in a way. So yeah, I just sound like a fanboy, but I love the guy. He's, he's amazing. I already put 20 kilos on my snatch grip RDLs today because Owen was benching so much. I felt like, I felt like a real wuss. So I got my legs, I got my chest, I got my ribs. So that's an old game from the Sega Mega Drive. I need to get it, most of it you get touched up. I got a little uh, astronaut and shit. And then I got the start of a like, Marvel mashup on my side. Um, and then a bit of a stag there. So it's about time to tell you, you need to fucking talk about it. set up I leave just a little bit yeah so I'm back maybe I don't know what is that like four or five centimeters I don't really know centimeters yeah. very well it's maybe an inch and a half yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like a little over a thumb in there yeah. and then when I go to pull in I then am like right in contact right yeah. so at this point the bar is like touching my sock yeah like it's just skimming so when I set up uh, I try to leave just a little bit of room so that when I pull in 
and then the exact right spot. So just try to set up a little bit further back. Like, I don't know, what's a good reference point for that? It's behind my laces. So I also set up with my knees forward a little so I can feel the bar, yeah. and then I straighten out, and then when I pull in, I'm there. Right? Yeah, so if you're setting up this close already, back here, then yeah, you're going to hit the bar. Yes. But if you set up and like bend your knees into the bar, yeah. then you can tell where you're going to be once you get the bend. Right? Yeah. And if you're just yeah. skimming there, then you can straighten in your back, you can set up, pull in, yes. and then there you are. That's good. Cool. So, I would consider my position a bottom up uh, setup, and, and somebody who does a top down setup uh, does it as I described earlier there. compromise a lot of position that you can't then make up. cases that's going to make the deadlift uh, less consistent and less repeatable as far as the technique is concerned uh, and in many cases it's going to be a compromise in that position that you just worked so hard to create. So uh, I think a lot of people really rush off the floor and that ends up in a loss of position. So what I recommend is being what I call patient off the floor, easing it off the floor. try to investigate and play with more is, is that upper back position. Um, so just go ahead and, and get back on the bar. I won't, I won't make you pull in your reps, no. Okay. Um, and just kind of take your grip and pull into tension. I, I might make you hold it and you might hate me for a while, but we're playing around with, with sort of what your back's doing. Now what I would get you to do is try to push that chest out a little more. There we go, lats down a little more. There. And that's where I would try to have you pull from and maintain. This is like the purpose of my life. This is, this is the best feeling I get ever, is, is doing things like this. Being able to be like, oh, change these three things, and they're like, oh my god, it feels so good. When I was learning how to lift, it was, it was just me teaching me. Lock it, lock it. Nice squats, man. How they feel? So to be able to uh, troubleshoot and offer some suggestions and advice and those kinds of things is huge. Yeah, makes me feel really damn good. Yeah.